Right now on Morning News Now, the holiday getaway officially underway with millions of people heading out of town for Thanksgiving. We are seeing more people flying than ever with fewer cancellations than we have seen in years. Mother Nature, of course, is, is the X factor in all of this. So what does Mother Nature have in store? We have team coverage, including a strong storm system that could put a damper on your plans. Also this morning, a desperate plea from the families of hundreds of hostages being held captive in Gaza as Israel and Hamas negotiate over their release. Meanwhile, the Israeli military expands its ground assault to the north, focusing on a new hospital packed with patients. We'll bring you the latest. Plus, more Americans feeling the pressure financially, with a majority saying they are living paycheck to paycheck. The new report on a sad reality and how you can stay on budget this holiday season. And a reminder to mind your manners this Thanksgiving. What you need to know about the proper etiquette ahead of the holiday, whether you're a host or a guest, and what you should and shouldn't talk about at the dinner table. I think if you're the host, you get to make the rules, right? Isn't that how it works? Good morning. I'm Savannah Sellers. Joe is off today. Thank you for joining me. We're going to get started with that severe weather that is threatening to upend the Thanksgiving travel rush. The U.S. is expected to see a record-breaking number of travelers this Thanksgiving as millions of Americans prepare to spend the holiday with family and friends. But a powerful storm system moving east over the next few days could create major issues during this already hectic time. It's expected to bring heavy rain and strong winds to the eastern half of the country. We have got your forecast with Michelle coming up in just a moment, but first we're going to get started with what travelers can expect in our nation's airports. We find NBC News reporter Julia Jester at Reagan National Airport with the latest on that. Julia, good morning. Happy almost Thanksgiving. Thanks for being with us. So what are airports expecting and how are they expected to be affected, but also how are they preparing? Good morning, Savannah. As you just mentioned, there is a weather wonderland happening across the East Coast and other parts of the country that could really impact travel here in D.C. as well as other major airport hubs like Atlanta, Chicago, New York City, which has a travel warning due to heavy rainfall and winds, uh, Chicago, uh, and at seeing some Midwest uh, potential weather that could disrupt that hub. And airports across the country have been preparing for this travel surge for months. You might remember last winter, Christmas holiday season, airlines, especially uh, Southwest, got into some deep trouble because they were vastly disrupted by weather. So airports across the U.S. have been investing in weather prediction technology as well as de-icing equipment. Uh, airlines have also been beefing up staffing and training. The Federal uh, Aviation Administration has been making making sure that it has been training and recruiting air traffic controllers to really streamline the process to avoid delays and cancellations, Savannah. Oh, yes, we all remember the great Southwest meltdown. Aye, aye, aye. Let's hope nothing quite that bad happens. So tell us, what can flyers do to try to help make their travel as seamless as possible? What should we keep in mind? Great question. The airports, the airlines, TSA are all advising travelers to be prepared and be patient. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg had this message ahead of the busy Thanksgiving holiday travel season. We want everyone to be prepared for changes due to weather and travelers should be checking with their airline directly for the most up-to-date information about their flights, including any delays or cancellations. And with these preparations that travelers can do, that includes everything from making sure that if you have TSA pre-check, that that is indicated on your boarding pass. So mm -hmm. There are no surprises when you get in line. It means taking those extra steps when you're packing to make sure that you're not packing anything in your carry-on that needs to be checked because those little actions can really create a backup at the airport in terms of those security lines. And make sure you give yourself time to get to the airport early and have a backup plan to the backup plan, whether that is knowing alternatives for 
potentially driving or taking a train. Mm. Savannah? I know TSA is expecting this to be their busiest holiday season ever. So little things like making sure your toiletries aren't in your carry-on and stuff like that can help us all. Julia, thank you very much. Happy holidays. Well, let's keep our Turkey Day travel coverage going with meteorologist Michelle Grossman, who's here with us. Hey, Michelle, good morning. Hey there, Savannah. Great to see you. And as Julia mentioned, we do kind of have it all. We have a big storm system. It's an impactful one today. Uh, we're, we're looking at some wintry weather, some ice even, where you see the pinks and purples. Then we have some heavy rain falling from the Great Lakes all the way down to the southeast. Those darker colors, the brighter colors showing us where the heaviest rain is falling. So there is quite a lot of heavy rain falling. To the southern tail, we're looking at the chance for severe weather once again. We had some severe weather yesterday, some wind reports, some tornado reports. We could see that once again in portions of the northern Gulf. I'll show you that in just a minute, but it's making its way towards the northeast into the mid-Atlantic. You can even see in Pennsylvania, we're looking at some wintry weather as well. So as we zoom in a little closer, we're looking at all that heavy rain. This is kind of pulling off the Gulf. So we're going to see that rain in place all day long. And in terms of the severe weather, we're looking at the chance for severe storms wherever you see this green. So from the mid-Atlantic all the way down to the southeast and especially where you see that yellow. That's where we're expecting the likelihood for some strong storms. That includes Montgomery, Mobile, down to Pensacola. We could see winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour with any of these storms. A few tornadoes are possible as well. Low chance for hail, but we still could see some and also that heavy rain, heavy downpours that could lead to a little bit of flash flooding throughout the day. That's going to cause some problems in the air. We're, look, we're expecting some delays, likely in Detroit, Chicago, wherever you see the red icon, D.C., Raleigh, Charlotte, Atlanta. Could see some likely delays in Nashville, even Philly, New York, because we're going to see this really overtaking the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic over the next couple of hours. We're starting to cloud up, and then we'll see that rain coming. Now, as we go throughout time here, this is a setup. Big area of low pressure. It's a long, cold front. It has a lot of moisture with it, and it's moving off to the North and East. There is that wintry weather we're expecting to the interior parts of the Northeast, and also also New England, lots of heavy rain on the warm side of this system. It's going to move off to the north and east pretty quickly. That's the good news. So today, big impact. Tomorrow, not so much. Back behind it, though, we're going to have breezy conditions, really chilly conditions. We do have the chance for some lingering showers and snow showers in portions of New England, but then it's really out of here on Wednesday. So improving conditions for so many of us. But look at all this rainfall. This is a lot. And a lot of the grounds are saturated here. So we could see a little bit of flooding, not widespread, but localized. Again, where you see those oranges and reds, that's especially where we're looking at the chance for some really heavy rain. We're expecting ice to. This is the worst when we're trying to travel because it's slick. It kind of just sits on top of the roadways. You mm. really cannot drive on that. So we're looking at where you see the purple. That's the likeliest hood likelihood of seeing icy glaze and there is the snow, especially in portions of Vermont, New Hampshire, into Maine. We could see over eight inches in some spots in northern New England, which I don't know. I feel like that might be a good thing yeah. for those New Englanders, right? And then by right. Wednesday, we're looking at cool and breezy conditions back through the Tennessee Valley, the south central states, into the northern plains, soggy northwest. So that will be our next storm. But Wednesday, Savannah looking better, and Thursday, we're pretty quiet. We're going to be breezy in some conditions, but we'll talk about that next hour. Yes, we will, and talk about the turn home, right, on the uh, yeah. Sunday. All right, Michelle, thank you so much. <laughs> sure. Well, President Biden celebrated his 81st birthday yesterday at the White House with some feathered friends. He carried out the White House's annual Thanksgiving tradition of pardoning two lucky turkeys. They were named Liberty and Bell. They hail from Minnesota, and Biden says they love honey crisp apples, ice hockey, and the city of Bloomington's famous Mall of America. These birds really got the VIP treatment ahead of their White House visit. As per usual, they shared a luxurious room at the Willard Hotel in Washington. This presidential tradition began back in 1947 with President Harry Truman. Well, a major shakeup in Silicon Valley is rocking the tech industry this morning. The man who became the face of ChatGPT was kicked out of the company he founded, but then quickly hired by Microsoft. NBC News senior business correspondent Christine Romans has the latest. Sam Altman, the face of chat GPT and artificial intelligence in a messy boardroom ouster. Altman's the Zuckerberg to social media, Musk to electric vehicles. He's the golden child. And he's out at OpenAI, the company he co-founded, the board vaguely blaming transparency. Altman and his co-founder then scooped up by OpenAI's biggest investor, Microsoft, with most of the 700 OpenAI employees vowing to walk too. This is probably the biggest example of disaster of corporate governance that I've seen in 25 years. And it's going to raise eyebrows in the Beltway. It's going to raise eyebrows in Brussels and the EU, just given how important this technology is. 
It's a boardroom drama that crystallizes the push and pull in Silicon Valley. The rush to commercialize AI versus the need to go slowly to protect society from unintended consequences. OpenAI's ChatGPT is a tool that can be used to write a best man speech, a holiday recipe, even help research on a midterm paper. It even has the potential to be a new industrial revolution. Think drug development and testing, curing cancer, even tackling climate change. There's downside, though. AI has been a tool for weaponizing disinformation, impersonation fraud, deep fakes, online harassment, and consumer scams with the potential for untold millions of jobs replaced by this technology. It's a new frontier controlled by a small group of people, and the drama and dissent show there's no real agreement over how to proceed with a technology that is changing more rapidly than Congress's ability to understand it and regulate it. Back to you. All right, Christine Romans, thank you so much. Well, for more on this tech revolt we're seeing, we are joined by futurist and founder of tech education company Way, Sinead Bovell. Sinead, thanks so much for being with us again this morning. So as Christine just mentioned there, hundreds of employees are threatening to resign if Altman isn't reinstated. The former president, Greg Brockman, had quit after he had been pushed out. They'd also like to see him back. First, just tell us, why has this decision provoked such a strong response from employees? Right. Well, you can see that employees really believe first and foremost in Sam Altman as a leader. OpenAI is at the frontier of AI innovation in this decade, and Sam Altman is a big reason for that. And so you can see that that's where employees' vision and that's where employees' loyalty, loyalty lies. Uh, a big portion of the recruiting efforts at OpenAI, why they've been able to pull in such strong talent is because of Sam. Why they've been able to get the investments that they have, again, is because of Sam. Uh, so employees really believe in him. They believe in him as a leader, and they believe he is integral to the success of OpenAI. Uh, and if he's not there, they're willing to walk. Do employees feel that they understand why he was pushed out? Not entirely. And that is a big question mark in this corporate drama more broadly. The board, at least publicly, hasn't come out and stated uh, why exactly or anything specific relating to, to Sam Altman's actions. We do know that as an, at an all-hands meeting on Saturday, uh, the chief scientist did state uh, that it Sam's actions potentially threatened uh, the duty of the board and their mission to carry out and build out advanced artificial intelligence in the best uh, interest of humanity. So we have these kind of high level takes, but we don't have a specific reason or a specific event uh, that the board seems to be making their decision off of. So the number of employees that have signed this this document saying, you know, we will walk out if, if this isn't rectified. It, it seems to be most of the company, actually. D does something like that mean that there is actually a chance we could see Altman return to open AI if the board understands just how, how severe this walkout might be? Yeah, and there are a few reasons why this might be the case. We know Microsoft, who has tentatively... Uh, assigned or, or, or hired Sam and, mm -hmm. and Greg has also been quite clear that that isn't concrete. Uh, and so it does seem like negotiations are still happening for uh, Sam and Greg to move back to open AI. And I do think with over 90% of employees at OpenAI threatening to leave, that is existential for the company. Uh, so if OpenAI as a company and if the board wants to see OpenAI continue, reinstating Sam and Greg seems to be integral to that. Uh, but again, the board's mission uh, is not necessarily to the commercial success of OpenAI. We know that OpenAI was originally founded as a nonprofit with the goal to care bring out uh, the most advanced AI humanity has ever seen, but for the benefit benefit of, of, of mm. humanity and ensuring that that AI systems remain safe. Uh, and so that's where first and foremost their, their duty and obligation lies from their perspective. But I do think it's possible we see a return from Greg and Sam. And Sinead, quickly before I let you go, putting a pin in the potential return, in the time being, Emmett Shear, co-founder and former CEO of a very popular video platform called Twitch, confirmed that he would be this interim CEO of OpenAI. What do we know about him and does that kind of calm the backlash we're seeing from employees? We just have a few moments, but what do you think? 
I'm going to say that it, it doesn't calm the backlash. Employees stated in their kind of walkout letter uh, that moving CEO Mira Murati as the temporary CEO and putting in this new this new CEO from Twitch uh, was against what they believe is the best interest of the company. We do know that he was the CEO of Twitch, um, which is a, a successful company. However, the leadership skills of any company don't necessarily qualify to lead an AI company because this mm. technology is going to change the world. So it comes with an entirely different you know, responsibility. And so we don't yet know if, if Sheer has that capability. Mm. Sinead Bovell, as always, thank you so much for joining us. Well, now let's head to Washington, where a federal appeals court is weighing whether a gag order imposed on former President Donald Trump is constitutional. This is in the criminal case accusing him of trying to overturn the results of the 2020 election. Lawyers for Trump and the Justice Department squared off in a hearing on the order Monday. The gag order bars Trump from disparaging witnesses, prosecutors, and court officers in the federal election interference case. Special counsel Jack Smith's team argued the order is needed to keep people safe. Trump's team argued it violates his free speech and ability to campaign for president. For more on this, we are joined by NBC News Justice reporter Ryan Riley. He's also the author of Sedition Hunters, How January 6th Broke the Justice System, a fairly new and fabulous book. Ryan, good morning. Thank you very much for joining us. So earlier this month, the gag order was put on hold until these arguments could be heard. So walk us through how each side made their case and any indication of which way it looks like this is possibly headed. Yeah, I think the most likely outcome is probably a slightly narrower uh, gag order in scope, maybe opening up the ability for Trump to criticize uh, the special counsel a little bit more, but really focusing on the threats against um, people who are testifying in this case overall. What the judges were sort of discussing here, as you'll hear in a moment, uh, was as this gets closer to the election, they don't want to have, they don't know why the court should have to wait for something to happen, given all of the indicators that we've seen about what happens to people who Donald Trump Trump targets. Take a listen. As this trial approaches, the atmosphere is going to be increasingly tense. Why does the district court have to wait and see and wait for the threats to come rather than taking a, a reasonable action in advance? He's a high profile public figure who posts uh, it's lots and lots and lots of followers. He's expressing his views as the First Amendment allows. When the defendant engaged in repeated inflammatory personal attacks on someone, there is a causal link between that person then receiving harassment, threats, and intimidation. The order is unprecedented, and it sets a terrible precedent for future restrictions on core political speech. And we have just seen this in cases after case after case where people who Donald Trump target do end up at the you know the back end of all of these threats. He is aware, I think, of what happens to people that he targets, and that's sort of part of it. So it is this really tricky question of, of what exactly they can restrict, what exactly they have to allow Donald Trump to say because of the First Amendment. It's a really, really tricky uh, case for uh, the appeals court to hear here, and that's why you know it's this really unusual event, but this is a really unusual trial. Ryan, what stuck out to you in the judge's questioning here of both sides? And did any of it kind of express just how concerned they were about the threat of political violence uh, in light of commentary like this? Yeah, you know, I think that it was interesting to just hear them sort of grapple with this notion that, you know, do, what do, does Donald Trump know what happens to the people that he ends up targeting? And I think, you know, you can't really ignore that. So, you know, he does this little dance and is very careful in the way that he words a lot of uh, the things. But, you know, we've seen this time and time again, especially in this New York trial where he's targeted members of the court staff, for example, who have been on the receiving end of a lot of uh, vitriol from his followers. And, you know, one of the January 6th defense actually went to Obama's house just a few months ago after Donald Trump posted Obama's address on his social media platform. The judge in this case, Judge Chutkin, has received threats herself from a woman um, who was in Texas and has been now been charged uh, in connection with that case. So there's a very real world threat going on here as a result of what Donald Trump posts on his social media accounts. But it really is just tricky for them to grapple with in terms of the First mm -hmm. Amendment considerations. All right. Ryan Riley, thank you so much. Well, Hamas leaders say they are nearing a truce agreement with Israel to secure the release of Israeli hostages being held in Gaza. The group didn't offer any additional details, though, about the negotiations. President Biden was asked about the potential deal yesterday. Here's what he had to say. Mr. President, is a hostage deal near? A 
It comes as fighting intensifies between Israel and Hamas. Heavy gunfire has erupted around the Indonesian hospital, prompting the World Health Organization to begin evacuations of the facility. NBC News Chief International Correspondent Keir Simmons has the latest. Well, good morning. A diplomat with knowledge of those hostage talks telling NBC News this morning that an announcement on a hostage deal may be imminent. Now, the Qatari foreign ministry making a series of announcements this morning in a news conference saying that negotiations have reached a critical and final stage, that we do not have a final agreement on the truce yet, but saying that an announcement of the details will be made as soon as they are reached. Meanwhile, multiple news organizations quoting sources from Hamas and Israeli sources outlining what a deal might look like. And I'm just going to look down to set out that, that outline for you. Uh, the idea, according to those reports, are a, a multi-day ceasefire uh, with at least 50 Israeli and international hostages freed in waves with more to follow and Palestinians detained in Israel, uh, women and children, released in exchange. All of this news this morning comes as the fighting continues in Gaza, in particular around the Indonesian hospital where there is continued fighting and Israeli tanks and many patients and doctors still trapped there. We've seen pictures of children being evacuated from the Indonesian hospital uh, to the south, but still there are many uh, still there. So hopes this morning, real hopes that the president yesterday uh, saying that uh, he is crossing his fingers, showing that he is crossing his fingers. So hopes, but at the same time, there is still continued fighting inside Gaza. All right, Keir Simmons, thank you so much. Well, coming up on Morning News Now, you could call it maybe the nightmare before Thanksgiving. From travel problems to planning a big dinner, sometimes dealing with family, the holidays can be a stressful time of year. Well, later this hour, we will get some tips on how to deal with it all. Up first, though, after the break, freeway fallout will take you to Los Angeles, where police are searching for a person of interest after a massive fire that shut down a major interstate. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Police are asking for the public's help identifying a person of interest in that massive fire that shut down a Los Angeles freeway. Their request comes as the highway reopens just in time for the Thanksgiving travel rush. Here's NBC News correspondent Liz Kreutz with more. An urgent search for the person who intentionally started this massive inferno under a Los Angeles freeway. We still are looking forward to anyone that uh, wishes to come forward with any information around uh, this suspect. Cal Fire releasing these images over the weekend of a person of interest in the arson that caused one of the city's busiest highways to shut down, creating a logistical nightmare for drivers and business owners in downtown L.A. and beyond. Authorities describing the suspect as an approximately six foot tall man weighing between 170 to 190 pounds, black hair, wearing a black hoodie, blue shorts and a knee brace. They say he also appears to have a visible burn on his left leg. As the manhunt continues, for many residents, a welcome Thanksgiving surprise. The good news is there was more good news. Just in time for holiday travel, overnight the damaged stretch of Interstate 10 reopening days and even weeks earlier than previously expected. You know, it was a week or so ago that we were here not knowing if we would be here at this moment announcing the reopening uh, for six more months. Governor Gavin Newsom sharing the news of the expedited timeline on Sunday alongside local officials and Vice President Kamala Harris, who praised the construction teams working around the clock over the last eight days. The work that happened here is extraordinary, and the estimates were that this was going to take a long time. There were some who said that a three to four week estimation was ambitious. Officials say the repairs could cost an estimated $3 million and will be covered by federal funds. Authorities are also investigating the private company that leases the area where the fire started, with state officials looking into how they manage the property. Now, as travelers hit the road this holiday week... We wouldn't have to wait till Thursday to give thanks. To give thanks for the opening before the Thanksgiving holiday of the I-10. A massive sigh of relief in a city already notorious for traffic.
Mm. Our thanks to Liz Kreutz for that report. Well, let's get to international headlines now, starting with a new $100 million aid package for Ukraine from the U.S. Claudio Lavanga joins us now from Rome with that and more. Hey, Claudio, good morning. Good morning. That's right. On Monday, the U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin made a surprise visit to Kyiv, where he also announced a new $100 million aid package for Ukraine. Now, this new package includes artillery shells, anti-aircraft missiles, small arms ammunition, and javelin and 84 launchers. At a press conference, Austin said the new package will make sure that Ukraine troops, quote, have the means they'll need for successful fighting in the winter time. Vladimir Zelensky called Austin's visit a very important signal for Ukraine, especially at the time uh, the world's attention is drawn to the war between Israel and Hamas. Now let's go to India, where 41 workers have been trapped in a tunnel that caved in after a landslide for the past nine days. On Monday, rescuers drilled a pipe through the debris into the tunnel through which they slipped some food and a camera that showed they are still alive. The footage shows the men who are still wearing safely helmets and jackets smile and wave at the camera. Their colleagues and, fa and families say they are delighted to see their friends after so many days, but now are waiting to see them in the flesh. And let's end this short tour of the world in Barcelona, where on Monday, Colombian pop star Shakira agreed to pay a $7 million fine over tax fraud allegations. Shakira was accused of failing to pay more than $15 million in Spanish income tax between 2012 and 2014. By accepting the deal, she avoids a trial and the risk of a three-year prison sentence. In a statement, the singer said she was ready to defend her innocence, but decided to prioritize her career and kids because, and I quote, winning is not a victory if the price is that they rob you of so many years of your life. Mm. Back to you. Wow. All right, Claudio, thank you so much. Well, coming up, a new clue that could hint at a major health problem. Up next, what researchers are saying about a link between a certain type of fat and Alzheimer's disease. Plus, it's a shared struggle for many young people, a fear of rejection or failure. We'll tell you what parents can do to help their kids deal with these emotions. This is Morning News Now. We're back now with information about a new study that shows a certain type of belly fat may be linked to a higher risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. We're talking about what's called visceral fat. It can build up around the organs. According to the study, which will be presented at the annual meeting of the Radiological Society of North America in Chicago next week, MRI scans show it's associated with changes in the brain. For more, we are joined by NBC News medical contributor, Dr. Natalie Azar. Dr. Azar, always great to have you with us. Thanks for joining us on a holiday week. Um, all right, so help us understand exactly what visceral fat is. And then also, I mean, it seems surprising to me that being linked to your brain, but just kind of how that works. I know, right. So, you know, those, I don't know if you remember those commercials, like if you can pinch more than an inch. Do you remember that? Yes, those? yeah. That refers to the, what's called the subcutaneous fat, which is the fat that's right under the skin. That is not what we're talking about. Okay. We're talking about the, the visceral fat, which is below the abdominal muscles. You can't see it, but it essentially encases your internal organs. And a little bit is okay. It actually protects your organs, but too much is not okay. And we've known for a long time that visceral fat increases the risk of heart disease and diabetes and hypertension. And if you think, we, we talk a lot that there's this connection between cardiovascular mm. disease as well as cognitive health and your mental health. The theory here is that, that that visceral fat increases inflammation. It also increases insulin. And those two things can actually be an issue with the accumulation of those proteins in the brain that are called amyloid. You know, mm, those are mm -hmm. characteristic of Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. that it, it prevents breakdown of those amyloid plaques. That's the hypothesis. That's what these researchers are looking at. Nothing definitive, but that's what they're looking at. So how can you tell if you have this, if it's not really something that you can see? And is it... Is the difference between it and just like a little bit of a normal type of belly fat obvious? So usually the easiest way to think of it is like, you know how we sort of have that middle age spread. You know how people gain weight and they gain it in their bellies mm -hmm. and you can kind of see that. Right. Um, especially I feel like in men it's easier to see because they naturally have le more lean uh, muscle mass. And so when you get older you get that sort of around the middle. Mm -hmm. You can measure it. You can take a tape measure and you can measure right above the, the pelvic bones right uh -huh. here. 
greater than 35 inches for women or greater than 40 inches for men um, is considered a risk, fact, a risk factor. You would wow. really technically need to do an MRI of your belly to see that because you can actually have a normal BMI. You can be thin and have excess visceral fat, but for most people, it's just going to be that typical middle age <clears throat> weight gain in the middle area. That's where you're going to notice it. So what do you do about this? You lose visceral fat the way you lose any kind of fat, and okay. that is with diet and with exercise. There's no magic. It's not like you have to do more crunches or, you know, right. it, it's not that. <laughs> it's, it's, really, it's really about losing, losing weight. Um, and when you lose weight, you, you do lose that visceral fat. So it's mm -hmm. diet and exercise the old-fashioned way. Wow. It feels like we've learned a lot about Alzheimer's <clears throat> in the last few years, which in some ways is We promising. have, and you always remember, like, what, what happened. What's good for the heart right. is good for your brain. Mm, there you go. Easy way to think of it. Dr. Azar, thank you so much. You all right, well, now it's time for our weekly mental health check-in, and we have tips to help get you through the stress of the holidays, plus want to know if your child is having, troubling hand, is having trouble handling their feelings. Let's bring in Dr. Erica Richards for more on this. She is the chair of psychiatry at Sibley Memorial Hospital and an assistant professor of psychiatry at Johns Hopkins Medicine. Dr. Richards, always great to have you with us. Thanks for being here. So let's start with holiday stress. So we are just two days away from Thanksgiving, and for some, it can come with a lot of stress, a lot of worries. You know, you're hosting, you've got family maybe you haven't seen in a while. What are some tips for handling those feelings and still trying to enjoy yourself? Good morning, Savannah. We're, we're there. The holidays have come. And with that, sometimes it's a lot of stress. And, you know, the American Psychological Association did a recent poll and one out of three Americans expect to be more stressed this year than they were last year. And that can come for a lot of different reasons. But in order to manage that stress, I think there's three things important to highlight. One is make sure that you're considering attending therapy, talking about those feelings, talking about that stress, and understanding why you feel that way. Another is to unplug. Now, I'd like to say enough said with that. Everyone knows what that means, but it's obviously easier said than done. So very important to try to put down the phone, put down the emails, and be intentional with the time that you're spending with others. And most importantly, probably go outside, get fresh air, get sun, get exercise, because we know all of that is really important for mental health and will help us through some of those stressful moments during the holidays. Mm, really, really good tips there. Um, okay, this other one that we're talking about with kids and handling their emotions, I think, you know, of course, they need help from adults sometimes, but there is something specific called uh, rejection sensitive dysphoria, I think is that how you say it. How can parents spot if their kids have this disorder, if it's a little bit more than just, you know, normal feelings of, of anxiety or stress being young, what can a parent do to identify it and help? So rejection sensitive dysphoria, an important concept that is evolving. I want to highlight the fact that this is not in our, what we call our DSM, our Diagnostics and Statistics Manual that we use to make diagnoses in mental health, but research is ongoing. The reason research is ongoing is because this can be, in kids, an oversized reaction to what's perceived as a minor slight. And I highlight perceived because sometimes there hasn't been any negative energy, there haven't been negative comments, but to the person, especially to kids, it's perceived that way. And it's really hard for them to let it go. Mm. So parents are getting education about what to do, how to, what they say, quiet the brain, how to really understand what their children are experiencing, when they need additional support. Cognitive behavioral therapy is one of the things that we use to highlight that. But it's important because there is a link with ADHD or attention deficit hyperactivity mm. disorder. And so understanding this rejection sensitive dysphoria will really help us study ADHD mm. and interventions for that. Wow, that's that's really good to hear. Um, finally, doctor, this is interesting. Music therapy, this is growing in popularity, people turning to that to help their physical and mental health. What is it and who can this help? So important to understand, music therapy is an evidence-based therapy. We've studied it enough to know that it works. Um, some people have heard of other speech therapy, physical therapy. Musical therapy is something else that can be used for a range of disorders, anything from dementia to depression to helping women kind of cope with pain and stress during childbirth. And what it is, there can be active parts of it. You can learn how to play an instrument and working with a therapist, which can be really peaceful and helpful for some. You can listen to therapy. You can listen to music to help with that therapy, which helps people calm the brain as well. But most importantly, we know that music can trigger memories, even if it's not associated with those memories. So a lot of people have, helped, have found it helpful to really sit and understand 
prior memories and to get back to a calm place. Mm, absolutely. Dr. Erica Richards, thank you very much. Thanks, Savannah. Coming up, more Americans dealing with debt. When we come back, the new study shedding light on a growing problem, plus how you can keep your finances in check this holiday season. And it's a time to give thanks and keep your elbows off the table. <laughs> this is sound like my mom. We'll get a lesson in proper dining etiquette this Thanksgiving. That's next on Morning News Now. Welcome back. Well, with Thanksgiving almost here and holiday shopping already underway, Americans say they're feeling the pressure financially. That is according to a new report by the Lending Club. That's a financial services company. It found 60 percent of adults say they are living paycheck to paycheck heading into the holidays. Let's bring in Caleb Silver for more on this, our friend and editor in chief at Investopedia. Caleb, good morning. Always great to have you with us. So hearing that number, 60 percent living paycheck to paycheck, also kind of the inverse of that stat is four in 10 consumers consider themselves worse off than last year. Uh, with inflation cooling, or at least we've kind of started to see that, and interest rates at least a pause in the hikes, does it surprise you to hear stats like that? Yeah, because money has gotten more expensive over the last year and a half through all these interest rate hikes. So it's credit card debt, mm. it's rent. Rent has gone up month after month. Food prices are still high. They've come down just a little bit, or at least they've stopped accelerating. So all the necessities, think about it, about a third of our paychecks usually go to housing. With rents rising, mortgage rates rising, that's now a little bit more than a third. That puts stress on everything else. And as you go into this holiday season where we're expected to buy mm. and people feel that stress because they feel the pressure to spend money on loved ones when, in fact, they don't have to. But it is a thing we get right. ourselves into every <laughs> single season. So consumer spending is such a driver of the economy. Does understanding that people are living this way and how that may make them react over the next few months into the holiday season uh, say anything about the overall health of the economy? Yeah, I mean, if consumers pull back on spending, that is 70 percent of GDP. Mm. So that could slow down the economy. That said, consumers rarely pull back on spending. And a big deal that's happened in the last couple of months, gas prices are way down. Mm. Gas prices is that psychological thing people see that makes them pull back on spending in other places, even though rent and food prices are high, too. So what we know so far about how people may spend. A little bit of it we're getting from this uh, Deloitte survey. It found that spending this week is expected to jump 13 percent. Shoppers expected to spend an average of $567 as they're doing that holiday shopping you're talking about for family members, for friends. What impact could that have on families that are already feeling strapped for cash? I mean, do you are you concerned about people being able to afford these expenses and then what it ultimately means for credit card debt? Yeah, well, they're just going to pile it onto their credit card debt. And a lot of people in that survey also said only 23 percent said they plan to pay it off. So mm. people overspending without a plan to pay it off, that's never a good thing. And we also hear these reports and we see it out in Investopedia, people looking how to tap their savings, how to tap their 401k to get some extra cash. That is a no-no, my friend. You can't be doing that, especially around the holiday season. Give us more tips, maybe some more no-nos. Yeah. How should we budget? Well, the yes, yes is our have a plan. <laughs> Stick to it. Have that number in mind and challenge yourself to come in or below that number when you're spending. Yes, Comparison yes. shop. You know, you can always get a better deal every time you look at something, whether it's off of Instagram or anywhere else. You get that discount code. Use it, but also comparison shop. You can get better deals. We also talk about these online coupons and store deals you see out there. Use those and rewards cards. Get paid to shop by earning rewards or use your rewards from mm. prior shopping to buy your gifts. That's a great way to not spend that extra money because you already earned it. Great tips. Thanks for the yes yeses. Caleb Silver, happy Thanksgiving. Thank we you. appreciate you being here with us this week. Well, let's give you some more financial headlines now. Amazon is launching new generative AI training courses for free. CNBC's Silvana Hanau joins us with that and other news. Hey, Silvana, good morning. Hey, Savannah, good morning to you. Yeah, so Amazon is launching a program to train millions of workers in AI skills as it seeks an edge in a battle for talent with Microsoft, Google, and others. The Wall Street Journal says the program called AI Ready aims to train at least 2 million people by 2025 on basic, on basic to advanced skills. Now, the training will be offered through eight online courses for beginners and those with more experience. They are free to access online through an Amazon learning site and are available for non-Amazon employees. A Senate panel has issued a subpoena to Live Nation and Ticketmaster for documents related to ticket prices and fees. 
Ticketmaster came under fire last year following the botched ticket sales for Taylor Swift's Eras Tour. The subpoena from the Senate Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations would require Live Nation, which owns Ticketmaster, to turn over documents and communications related to ticket prices, financial data regarding fees, the ticket resale business, and its relationship with artists and venues. And Krispy Kreme has a sweet treat for Buddy the Elf. The chain is celebrating the 20th anniversary of the classic holiday movie with the first ever Elf Donut Collection. Starting tomorrow, Krispy Kreme will offer three new Elf-inspired donuts, marking memorable moments in the film. A six-pack of the special donuts will be available at stores and select supermarkets, including Kroger, Publix, and Walmart Savannah. All right, I that's love fun. that movie, and I can't wait to try one of those. I know, I, and I can't wait to get that in the rotation. The yeah. movie. It's time. All right, Savannah. I started now. already. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much. Well, speaking of the holidays, in a couple days, people all across the country, of course, are going to be getting together to celebrate Thanksgiving. Whether you are a guest or a host, though, there are certain etiquette rules you need to know to avoid any awkward situations. Joining us now to discuss those rules is Mr. Manners himself, Thomas Farley. He writes the Mealtime with Mr. Manners column for NBC Today. Good morning. Thank you so much for being with us. I'm excited for you to take us to Manners School. So tell us, Let's start with this. Once you've decided that you're going to be heading to somebody's house for Thanksgiving, uh, what is the timing on RSVP? And, you know, because I'm hosting, for example, and I've had some squishy, like, oh, I might be able to be there. Oh, and I might bring somebody, all that kind of stuff. So when should somebody tell you for sure if they're coming and if they're bringing a guest? Yes, Savannah. So by now, here we are. It's Tuesday before Thanksgiving. <laughs> if you don't know who's coming, this is a problem for sure. Your guests, your invited guests should be letting you know as soon as possible within the time frame that they've gotten that invite, 24 hours, 48 hours later. Um, there's so much cooking and shopping and planning for the Thanksgiving mm -hmm. meal. That unexpected guests or surprise pop-ins um, can create problems. So as a guest, just be thankful you're not doing the cooking and get those RSVPs in right away. All right. And what about coming on time? And then the big one, and people always ask me this. See, I love to host, so I don't mind. And I kind of um, like everything to look the way I want it to look. So I don't always love actually when people bring things, but what should people bring that is kind of something nice for most hosts that they're going to be happy to have? Yes, and I'm so glad you're asking about that because we think, well, this is great. This is Thanksgiving. We're going, we're having a nice meal. Don't forget the host. So two things, don't come empty handed. You're gonna come double handed. So one is a gift for the host himself or herself, mm. a bottle of wine, something the host can enjoy after the celebration is over. This is your thank you to them. The second thing that should be in your hand is some sort of dish that can contribute to the meal, not just for yourself, but for others as well. Something to share in the spirit of Thanksgiving and the true spirit of Thanksgiving. And if you've got a dietary restriction, this is a great way to ensure that you've got something that you can eat and maybe you turn on others to your own dietary uh, likes and dislikes. But definitely come th with something in each hand and do not show up late. As you know, Savannah, as a host, this is, this is a holiday that requires all sorts of different tempo in the kitchen. Mm. You're showing up late. It's really throwing things off. So this is not the holiday to come fashionably late. Yes, tempo in the kitchen. Sounds so, makes me sound so professional. And thank you. I love the double-handed <laughs> tip. I assume the people who love me are watching my show, and they've just heard you say that. So there you go. Thomas, let's move now to hosting. Uh, one of the big things uh, when preparing a dinner, whether it's Thanksgiving dinner or any, is thinking about allergies, diet restrictions, things like that for people who are coming over to your home. Walk through the response responsibility it is of the host to accommodate specific requests. Yes. So this has gotten more and more difficult as the years gone by and as the dietary restrictions have rocketed. You know, time was maybe someone just had an allergy. Now everybody's got some sort of dietary restriction. It's pretty pretty certain thing that the, the pilgrims were not going gluten-free at the first Thanksgiving. Um, but as a host, <laughs> you really should be asking your guests, are there any dietary restrictions that I should know? about particularly allergies. The nice thing I feel about Thanksgiving in particular, because it's such a, we think about the turkey, of course, but it, because it's such a vegetable-friendly holiday, vegetables pretty much suit just about every dietary restriction. It suits for the vegans, it suits for the pescatarians, it suits for the vegetarians. So as long as you've got a, a nice adequate sampling of vegetables at your meal, you should be covering just about everyone. Uh, and then someone who's macrobiotic or someone who's a locavore, uh, they may simply be on their own because there are only so many individuals you can accommodate. 
Unless you're like me and you cover most of your vegetables in cheese, in which case you need to think <laughs> about that. Um, Thomas, we just have a few moments left, but of course, one of the big issues is table talk, politics, money, things like that. Um, is it still taboo to have those conversations, especially with so much going on in the world, or is there a way to do it and do it nicely? I So two solutions for that. Number one is the host have table cards. So if there are always oh. two guests who are constantly locking horns, you ensure they're not seated next to one another. Secondly, as a host, designate what I call the caucus room. This is a separate area of the house or the home <laughs> where the people who want to talk politics, which I think is important as long as it can be done respectfully, they can chat away from the earshot without holding everyone else captive to their political conversation. <laughs> I love the graphic that we just had up. Some funny tips there. Like, I'm going to tell people, take it outside. All right, Thomas B. Barley, thank you very much, Mr. Manners. We appreciate it, and happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving, Savannah. Well, coming up, music to our ears and our hearts when we come back. I'll take you to Chicago for a sweet surprise for a beloved music teacher. You're watching Morning News Now. Welcome back. Well, NASA has released a new image from the James Webb Telescope showing never-before-seen details of the Milky Way galaxy. The image shows an area called Sagittarius C. It's an active region of star formation located about 300 light years from the center of the galaxy. Half a million stars are visible in this picture. Isn't that amazing? Well, it includes baby stars that are still forming. Scientists think they can use the huge amounts of information in the image to learn more about the origin of the universe. So... That's just mind blowing. All right, well now, what better way to celebrate the season of giving than by ending this hour with a heavy dose of kindness? You are about to meet Anne Gray. She is a Chicago music teacher who has been instrumental, if you will, in inspiring her students to find their voice and dream big. With a little bit of help, I was able to pull off an epic surprise for both her and her students, making it a day we all won't forget. Take a look. You can't build an ensemble if you're not being kind to each other. So that's a big expectation in here, is that students are treating each other with kindness. Very good. For that's nearly 20 so years, good. Anne Gray has been teaching music at Franklin Fine Arts Center in Chicago. Tell me why music? To actually get to teach it in a classroom setting like this, what drew you to that? Music, quite frankly, is like the joy part of the day for a lot of kids, and they're always happy to be here. <laughs> One, two, three, four. Students from kindergarten to eighth grade learn how to play the ukulele and the drums, instruments secured through Mrs. Gray's grant writing and fundraising. There you go. You got it. That's right. Yeah. What? Yeah. Music education, just in general, is so powerful. It really gets at everything. Discipline, learning how to work hard is an important skill, and if you are learning that skill while you're doing something you enjoy, all right. You know, it shows you that work can be meaningful. I'm seeing kids, like, confidence go up in my classroom. And the music teacher's impact is hitting all the right notes. What is it about Mrs. Gray that makes her stand out? When she has students, she can instantly see their potential. She sees them as their authentic selves. She encourages students to feel like a literal rock star, and then she just cheers them on with everything she has. One saying she taught me when I was in third grade and I still remember, she's like, kindness is always the way to live. She encourages me by like always saying I got this whenever I'm doubting myself. She helps kids like us like find our voice. It's funny when they don't realize they're really good at something and they find that is my favorite thing about my job is that moment when that realization happens that like, I'm good at this. This is really awesome. So we're not only here to highlight how great Mrs. Gray is, we've also got a little something for her. And we've got about 200 of her students gathered in the auditorium. Let's go surprise her. Our cafetorium turns into... Mrs. Five. Gray thought she was giving me a tour of the school, but... <laughs> you might be kind of confused what's going on. <laughs> so first we want to play a message from our friend that might help explain it a little bit. Hello, everybody at Franklin Fine Arts. My name is Adam Sandler. Hello. Yeah. Uh, I just want to tell you I love you. Miss Gray, congratulations on being such a great lady. Wish the world had only Miss Grays in this world. You're awesome. You're about to watch 
uh, a movie called Leo before anybody. I think I'm in it. Have a good time. Congratulations, Miss Gray. Love you all. Bye-bye. Our sponsor, the Netflix film Leo, heard about how fabulous you are and all the incredible work that you're doing in your classroom. So... students that are in your classroom. We're getting some new amps, kids. <laughs> School's out, and now you get to watch a movie. Bring out the popcorn. What does today mean to you? It's an amazing surprise, and I can't say thank you enough. I don't know how to do this without crying. I guess it just means a lot for the kids to be acknowledged, because you know, it's them, everything's for them. So <laughs> I'm really grateful. Well, Mrs. Gray said, as you heard, she plans to get new amps, but also guitars and uniforms for her choir. We had so much fun at Franklin Fine Arts. We met some incredible other teachers and students, including Mrs. Gray's own kids. Two of them go there, Magnus and Vera, who told me it's nice to have their mom as their teacher, too. And they are very young and very talented at music. It was really impressive. Well, that's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. But stick with us because the news continues right now. Good morning and thank you for joining me this Tuesday. I'm Savannah Sellers. Right now on Morning News Now, the big Thanksgiving getaway is underway with millions taking planes, trains and automobiles for the holidays. But severe weather conditions are threatening those travel plans. We'll show you how you can get ahead and avoid the worst of it. Also this morning, Hamas says it's close to a truce agreement with Israel, echoing similar comments from U.S. officials. Reports suggest the deal to pause fighting could include the swapping of Israeli hostages and Palestinian prisoners, mainly women and children on both sides. The potential agreement comes as Israeli forces continue to bombard the entire Gaza Strip. And as the death toll soars in Gaza, the U.N. Secretary General says he's never seen anything like it before. What is clear is that we have had, in a few weeks, thousands of children killed. We are witnessing a killing of civilians that is unparalleled and unprecedented in any conflict since I am Secretary General. We've got the very latest from the ground. Hirings and firings. It's been a volatile few days for chat GPT owner OpenAI. We'll take a closer look at the boardroom drama that led to a revolt at the tech firm. Plus, we're getting new insight into Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey's relationship. On the same day, the football stars Kansas City Chiefs lost in a Super Bowl rematch against his brother's Philadelphia Eagles. We will bring you all the latest there, but we're going to get started this morning with a big Thanksgiving travel getaway. A record 55 million Americans are hitting the roads and skies for the holiday, but the latest forecast is showing that holiday travel could be on a collision course with severe weather. That's not what you want to hear. NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa is at Chicago's Ohio airport with the latest. Maggie, how are flights looking so far? Hey, Savannah, good morning from a busy O'Hare. So, so far, it seems like the weather is having a minimal impact on flights, which is obviously good news. FlightAware just at last check reporting under 400 uh, delays nationwide and fewer than 100 cancellations. That being said, those numbers obviously could climb throughout the day. The severe uh, storms wreaking havoc down south, those are now moving east, and officials are pleading with people flying and driving to basically allow extra time and have a backup plan, knowing how easily severe weather can throw a paralyzing wrench into holiday travel. This morning, with the Thanksgiving travel rush ramping up, Mother Nature is impacting holiday plans with bad weather nationwide. A string of tornadoes hitting the Gulf Coast overnight. In central Louisiana, a twister spawning half-dollar-sized hail, while three people had to be rescued from a home destroyed by severe weather. South of Jackson, Mississippi, strong winds and drenching rain pummeled a highway, making driving dangerous. That weather system now heading up the East Coast, New York City already issuing a travel warning, expecting wet and windy conditions in the Big Apple over the next 48 hours. For many, the timing couldn't be worse as they try to get home for the holiday. We got here three hours early. We was basically here asleep, waiting for the plane. 
With the FAA expecting 2.6 million people to fly every day this week. Well, demand is growing. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg telling NBC's Tom Costello storms could throw a major wrench into an already stressed system. We are seeing some weather systems that could play a role and affect flights. So it's going to be especially important to build a little bit of cushion into your plans. The same advice applies on the roads. With gas prices down almost 40 cents from a year ago, more than 49 million Americans are expected to drive for Thanksgiving, including friends Catherine and Jordan traveling an hour outside Chicago to see family. So you're making the drive Wednesday night. Do you expect the roads to be busy? I do, um, especially because I'm going on 55 and typically that traffic is just bad all of the time. Would you ever chance it and drive on Thanksgiving? Honestly, maybe because it might be less busy. Yeah. Her friend added that would be risky, though. You might make mom mad if you cut it too close. Now, that being said, AAA says that she might be right. The peak travel days are today and tomorrow, with Sunday slated actually to be the busiest of them all. And so all of that being said, experts, as always, have some tips for traveling in severe weather. If you're flying, they recommend checking to see whether your airline has what's called a weather waiver, allowing you to move your flight around the storm. Also, if you're driving, try and map your route around the storm's timing, and then try to also have a backup route an alternate just in case and then check other modes of transportation like trains or buses to basically come up with a plan b in case your plan a falls through savannah that's great advice all right maggie wow it is really busy there already thank you so much well our holiday storm track continues with meteorologist michelle grossman she's going to get us the forecast over the next few days hey michelle good morning hey there savannah great to see you and yeah we are looking at that high impact storm right now we're looking at heavy rain falling that's the biggest culprit with this storm but also looking at the chance for some wintry weather. We're seeing that now where you see the blues, the purples, the pinks. That's indicating where that wintry weather is falling. And then on the tail end of the system, we're looking at the chance for severe storms once again, mainly this morning through portions of uh, the northern Gulf Coast, Alabama, into the panhandle of Florida, then eventually into portions of the Carolinas and southern Virginia. So as we go throughout the next couple of hours, we're looking at the chance for really gusty thunderstorms, winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour. A few tornadoes are possible as well, especially where you see that yellow area, so Montgomery to Mobile. Uh, we're looking at the chance for some strong storms. That includes Pensacola as well. But notice this green goes all the way up to southern Virginia, and that's because we're looking at the chance for some strong storms even up there. Maybe not quite as strong as what we may see in the Gulf Coast states, but still some strong gusty storms. So we have the rain. We have that severe weather risk. We also have the chance of winter weather. So we're seeing some of that in places. We do have winter advisories, winter weather advisories. That's in the white. So for portions of New England into the interior parts of the Northeast, also parts of the upper Midwest, into uh, the Appalachians. We're looking at the chance for some wintry weather. Lots of rainfall, though. That's a big takeaway with the storm. One, two, even three inches of rain in some spots. That's on top of some grounds that are already saturated. So we could see some very localized flooding. We're not expecting widespread flooding, but still could see some uh, ponding on the roadways as you're out and about in the roadways. We could see some low clouds as well. That affects air travel. And lots of bright colors here telling us that we will see a lot of rain, especially along the East Coast. Ice. This is a big one when you're traveling. I hate traveling with ice and this makes it really really difficult where you see the purple here that's where we're expecting some ice and that's going to make it especially difficult as we're traveling today especially later on today and then snowfall could see up to eight inches in some spots that's where you see the purples and the pinks corresponding on that legend there so parts of maine into parts of uh, vermont and new england could see some higher amounts of snow Let's talk about air travel because we're looking at the chance of some delays. I know that we're seeing really good conditions right now, but as we go throughout the day and this kind of moves into the Northeast, we're looking at Detroit, D.C., Raleigh, Charlotte, Atlanta, likely to see some delays there, possible delays in New York City, also Philadelphia, especially later on this evening. Now, we're going to see that rain moving in later on this morning, but it's really going to take hold and become heavy as we go throughout the evening and overnight hours. That will extend into the early part of Wednesday, so we could see some impacts uh, tomorrow as well well, especially in the morning in Boston and New York City. That is likely there. Maine's going to be really tough, tough tomorrow morning. And then likely uh, delays in Philadelphia, D.C., Raleigh, also Charlotte. But it'll clear out later on Wednesday. So we start to improve. This is the map for tomorrow. Notice we're pretty quiet throughout the middle of the country. It's chilly. It's breezy. But we do have some lingering showers in the morning hours in New England, the Mid-Atlantic, the Northeast, also along the Gulf Coast states. It looks like the southeast. You could see some rain lingering a little bit later on Wednesday. Another storm system comes comes into play in the Northwest on Wednesday. That's going to be soggy. And then we do want to get to this because this is important.
and we're looking at mostly sunny skies for the parade, uh, the Macy's Thanksgiving to par parade. But we're going to be watching the wind, Savannah, because it's mm. going to be breezy. Oof. Looks like uh, sustained at 15 miles per hour. But we're going to have to watch the winds uh, gusting. So we'll be watching that over the next day and a half. Oh, that is never good. I know. On that day. It's the worst thing. Yeah, yeah, it really is. All right, Michelle Grossman, thank you so sure. much. And happy Thanksgiving. You too. Well, according to AAA, this year marks the third highest Thanksgiving travel forecast in 23 years. So whether you're flying or hitting the roads, we've got everything you need to know for how to prepare for your trip. AAA spokesperson Aixa Diaz joins us now. Good morning. Thank you so much for being with us. So tomorrow, I understand, is expected to be the busiest day on the road during this holiday travel period. So what can people do to try to help minimize their holiday traffic frustration? Yeah, and Savannah, when I look at that weather map, I just, I feel so terrible for people hitting the road tomorrow. It is expected to be the busiest day, and now you have a lot of bad weather for many people across the country. And AAA also projects that 2 p.m. and 6 p.m. are the worst times to be on the roads on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, because that's when holiday travelers mix with commuters on the roads. Keep in mind, many people work on Wednesday. So that's just uh, creating a recipe for, for a big mess. We advise hit the road early and be aware of what's happening along your route. So don't sort of just hit the road and not really understand that there could be construction, there could be delays. So check with those DOT notifications, traffic apps, and use 511 as a resource. Also slow down and move over. That means if you see an emergency vehicle on the side of the road or someone having their car repaired or serviced on the side of the road, give them room to do their jobs. Slow down and move over if you can safely. Yes, you'll also get a ticket for that in a lot of states if you don't mm -hmm. actually move over. So important reminder. Um, so I know you're, we're also expecting the highest number of Thanksgiving air travelers since 2005. Why do we think it is that more people are getting on an airplane? Demand for air travel has just continued to go up year after year since the pandemic in 2020. What we're seeing is that people want to get away, see family, see friends. And it's been a significant jump from last year. We're seeing a 6% jump in Thanksgiving air travel compared to 2022. So we're projecting 4.7 million people will be traveling. And those are round trips. When TSA counts numbers, they're counting each time someone goes through security. But we're just looking at the actual trip and 4.7 million people flying over the five-day holiday period. AAA looks at Wednesday through Sunday, so that's not even including the people who are leaving today or maybe coming back on Monday. What days are expected to be the busiest and most expensive is the other question to fly during the Thanksgiving holiday, although hopefully people have already figured this out. but <laughs> They've already <laughs> hopefully figured it out, and sometimes there are some last-minute deals to be had, but generally speaking, these are the days. Tuesday and Wednesday are the most expensive to fly, and what I was seeing, I was kind of checking some last-minute flights to see maybe if I want to fly to my destination instead of driving, and what I'm seeing is that flights going to my destination ahead of Thanksgiving aren't so bad. It's that Sunday ticket coming back that it's just through the roof. So that rules that out for me. So I'll be leaving Thursday morning. That's also a good time to leave. If you leave on Thanksgiving Day itself, early in the morning, whether it's a flight or driving, you're going to encounter less people out there on the roads and at the airports. Also, what about as you're looking ahead to the rest of the holiday season, what are we thinking in terms of, of pricing? We just have a few moments, but is it looking good or bad? Yeah, well, you know what? You can find some last minute deals if you're flexible, but if you want those nonstop trips or if you want to have some premium seating, you're going to have to pay more. All right. Aixa Diaz, thank you very much and happy holidays to you. Same. Let's stay on this because a record 30 million people are expecting to fly over this Thanksgiving holiday as we were just talking about. So what does it take to cover all those miles in the sky? I love this. We're getting an inside look at the day in the life of a plane. NBC News correspondent Tom Costello and his crew. I'm assuming, Tom, you had to start early and go late for this because a plane doesn't need sleep. So tell us what you found out. I know you're at Reagan National Airport this morning. Yeah. That's right. A plane doesn't need sleep, but I do. But the bottom line is we did about 19 and a half hours. We started very early on one plane. We went very late. Listen, American has 1,500 planes. They fly 6,000 flights a day. The crews, they come off, they go on. But we decided to stay on board the entire day. Good morning. How are you doing? 5 a.m. in Baltimore. And American Airlines first officer Jared Ziobro is prepping the flight deck. Every flight we're out here testing, making sure every system works properly. Flight crews will come and go, but planes get very little downtime. Group two customers are welcome to board. This plane came in last night at 11 o'clock, spent the night in Baltimore, and it's got a very long day ahead. 
biggest priority is just being ready for our passengers and staying in the pleasant mood. It's still dark as flight 1403 pushes back from the gate, then lifts off the runway just as dawn breaks. Thousands of flying miles lie ahead. Baltimore Washington Airport to Dallas Fort Worth, then DFW to Miami, Miami to New York LaGuardia, and returning back to Miami before the day is done. John Krikorian and John Urso beating the rush to Hawaii. There's a lot of people moving around, uh, there's a lot of stress. Three hours later, we touched down early in Dallas. Like clockwork, passengers deplane, the crew moves to another flight. And with the clock ticking, baggage handlers start loading up for the next flight. A typical narrow body plane holds about 280 pieces of luggage. They've got 45 minutes on a domestic flight to turn it before it has to go back out again. With planes flying full this week, American's chief operating officer says there's a constantly evolving backup plan for every flight and airport should weather-related delays start to ripple across the system. But put a lot of energy, a lot of technology, a lot of uh, things in place to make sure that we can manage the unexpected. 10.25 a.m., we're off to Miami. While passengers work, watch, and rest in the back, the crew encounters heavy rain in Florida. We land 11 minutes late. The cleaning staff, then catering, quickly move in. Next stop, New York with a full flight. Every day, American goes through a million cans of soda, half a million cookies, and 350,000 bags of pretzels. The sun has already set as we land in New York, then reboard for the flight back to Miami. The boarding process is very he hectic just because of luggage, everyone wants to bring gifts. Alessandro Tomas plans to work from her parents' home over Thanksgiving. I don't like to call it a vacation because I will be working from my childhood bedroom. But first, Miami is socked in with more rain. It's like a, a whole weather system right there. Our plane is able to land and in a long day, five stops, 4,500 miles, and it all starts again tomorrow. Yeah, it's a very long day. Listen, you know, those planes out there, they cost a lot of money. The airline is not making any money if they sit out on the ramp, only when they're in the air. And that's why they've got to keep them moving. As I said, 45 minutes to turn a plane. If they come in on a red eye, in other words, coast to coast, that means it's possible that plane will have been flying every hour of a 24-hour period, trying to make sure that the airline is making money wow. and moving passengers as fast as possible. Back to you guys. Oh, my goodness. All right, Tom, thanks for putting in the hard work for us, and happy Thanksgiving. Well, turning now to the war between Israel and Hamas, the group says they are close to reaching a deal to release hostages from Gaza. But few details have been released this morning in hopes that the agreement will be finalized soon. It comes as another hospital in Gaza becomes the center of intense fighting. NBC News Chief International Correspondent Kier Simmons joins us now from Tel Aviv with the latest here. Hey, Kier, good morning. Hey there, good morning to you. And a diplomat with knowledge of those hostage talks tells NBC News this morning that an announcement may be imminent. Now, uh, Qatar, which uh, has been mediating those talks and would likely make that announcement, saying this morning, we do not have a final agreement on a truce yet, but negotiations have reached a critical and final stage. This morning, a breakthrough in the hostage negotiations is closer than it's ever been, U.S. officials say. Mr. President, is a hostage deal near? I believe so. I'm not prepared to talk to you. believe so? Yes. Thank you. Multiple news reports quoting Hamas and Israeli officials are this morning outlining a possible deal. A multi-day ceasefire with at least 50 Israeli and international hostages freed in waves, with more to follow. And Palestinians detained in Israel, women and children released in exchange. After a late-night meeting with Israel's Prime Minister and War Cabinet, the families of hostages emerging frustrated without news. There was no new information given. They can't give any new information because this is, you know, it might jeopardize any effort that they're doing. This morning, Hamas saying it's close to reaching a truce agreement, but Israel not commenting. Inside Gaza, children evacuated to a hospital in the south overnight from a hospital in the north surrounded by fighting and Israeli tanks. Large numbers of patients and doctors remain trapped amid a still rising death toll in Gaza. 
We met Saif O'Day, who was working in Israel on October 7th and is unable to get back to Gaza. Ten days ago, he lost contact with his wife and three daughters, Celine, three, Sarah, seven, and Suha, eight. He's terrified they won't survive. Two of my daughters witnessed two wars. This is the second war while they're still children, he cries. The White House urging Israeli caution in Gaza, but again echoing its support for Israel's government when asked about protesters using the term genocide. Israel's trying to defend itself against a genocidal terrorist threat. So when we're going to start, if we're going to start using that word, fine, let's use it appropriately. Back to those hostage talks, Savannah. They could yet fall down, of course. Over the past few weeks, NBC News has been told that they revolve around the release of civilians and that they involve the proposal for humanitarian aid, including fuel. But, of course, they're in the U.S. with Thanksgiving coming up, the prospect, potentially, of hostages being released. That would be a happy moment, Savannah. All right, Keir Simmons, thank you very much. Well, now to the tech revolt that could potentially rock the artificial intelligence industry. The nonprofit that started ChatGPT is in chaos after more than 700 employees threatened to quit. That is most of the employees. This is after their former co-founder and CEO was picked up by Microsoft. For more on what all of this means to you, here's NBC News senior business correspondent Christine Romans. At the hottest company in the hottest sector of technology, the co-founders are out, the board under fire, and hundreds of its employees are threatening to quit. Four days ago, 38-year-old Sam Altman was at the helm of OpenAI, the company at the forefront of fast-moving artificial intelligence, technology that could change the way the world works. Altman's the Zuckerberg to social media, Musk to electric vehicles. He's the golden child. The board fired Altman without elaborating, blaming transparency issues. Writing to employees, his removal was, quote, necessary to preserve the board's ability to execute its responsibilities and advance the mission of this organization. Four board members of a company with 700 people essentially control a technology that could change every aspect of our lives. What Does Washington need to be involved here? I mean, this is probably the biggest example of disaster of corporate governance that I've seen in 25 years. But what looks like disaster for OpenAI could turn into a boon for others. Microsoft, a heavy investor in OpenAI, moved quickly, hiring Altman and his generals. And amid an AI arms race for talent, hundreds of employees signed an open letter threatening to resign. Amazon, Google, and Apple working quickly to poach top tech talent with offers in the tens of millions of dollars. The hope for AI. Think drug development and testing, curing cancer, modeling climate change and weather, making battlefields less deadly for civilians. But already there has been a downside. AI has been used as a tool for weaponizing disinformation, impersonation fraud, deep fakes, online harassment and has the potential to replace millions of jobs. Our thanks to Christine Romans for that report. Well, coming up, pledging more support. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin makes a surprise visit to Ukraine as the United States readies a new package of military aid for the country. Details of that up next. Welcome back. Let's get you some international headlines. An Italian court has sentenced more than 200 people in a historic mafia trial. Claudio Lavanga joins us now with that from, from Rome with more. Hey, Claudio, good morning. Good morning, Savannah. Yeah, that's right. Let's start here in Italy, where on Monday, as you mentioned, a court sentenced more than 200 mobsters in what became the country's largest mafia trial in more than three decades. Now, all the defendants were affiliated to the Andrangheta, the organized crime syndicate from the southern region of Calabria. This is how you pronounce it, actually. Considered the most powerful and violent mafia group in Italy. They were convicted of mafia association, extortion, bribery, and five murders and sentenced to a total of 2,200 years in prison. As you may expect from a big mafia trial like this, many of the defendants had colorful nicknames, including The Wolf, Fatso, Sweetie, 
and lamb thigh. Now let's go to Zimbabwe, where a deadly outbreak of cholera may have killed 150 people since February. Since the start of the outbreak, the country's health ministry has recorded more than 8,000 suspected cholera cases. And the Red Cross warned that there have been more than 500 cases a week since late October, the highest rate since February. Now, the Red Cross said cholera is a waterborne disease caused by poor hygiene, lack of awareness, but also religious practices in which self-proclaimed prophets order sect members to rely on prayer and items such as holy water rather than seek medical treatment. And let's end this tour of the world in Hong Kong, where Disney's World of Frozen opened its gates to the public. It's the first ever theme park dedicated to the Frozen media franchise, one of the most successful in Disney history. Children and those young at heart, of course, will all be able to immerse themselves in the fictional kingdom of Arendelle and visit the North Mountain, Elsa's Ice Palace, the snowflake-topped ice fountain and the clock tower, where Anna and the Prince sing Love is an open door in the first Frozen movie. Cast members playing Elsa, Anna and Kristoff will walk around interactive with guests. Well, I'm sure they will give the, a warm welcome that will melt the heart of Frozen fans. Back Claudio, you tonight. sounded like a Frozen fan yourself there. You had a lot of those details on lock. <laughs> <laughs> Never watched no. it, but okay. I will. <laughs> Thank you very much, Claudio. All right, let's switch gears now. As the fighting rages on between Israel and Hamas, the division on college campuses is growing too. At Cornell University, the tension between student groups supporting Israel and student groups supporting Palestine has reached a breaking point. NBC News correspondent Antonia Hilton spoke to the two groups separately about the divide, and she joins us now. Hey, Antonia, good morning. Good morning, Savannah. For weeks now on college campuses across the country, there has been immense heartbreak and pain as students who are directly affected by the fighting in Israel and in Gaza try to at times have conversations, but more often right now, they are retreating into their own communities and circles. And what we hear from students who are Jewish and have connections to Israel and to students who are Muslim and have connections to Palestine is that it's simply too early to come to a table and to think about peace or dialogue. Take a look. For weeks now, Cornell University's campus has been divided. Heartbreak over the war in Israel and Gaza is transforming campus life. We're getting threats on campus, so it's like, how can you mourn? We asked students from the Jewish organization Hillel and Students for Justice in Palestine if they wanted to meet together. Both groups declined. If you have family and friends in the region, it's not an intellectual exercise to debate and discuss. I don't know what both sides sounds like. I don't know what both sides looks like. I don't even think it's possible in this moment. Jewish students like Zoe and Simone, who are the descendants of Holocaust and pogrom survivors, say they've been horrified by people tearing down the posters of hostages. Every time I see one of them ripped or vandalized, it's like a knife into my chest. I saw one on campus just as I was walking home from class one day, and it's, they were crossed out the name of the four people in the picture, and they're a family of four taken um, by Hamas terrorists, and it said, Free Palestine. Palestine is not going to be freed by vandalizing hostage posters. Palestinian students like Melak say some classmates have denied her people even exist. She says her grandparents were expelled from their homes in 1948, and her relatives now live in Rafa City and the 75-year-old Jabalia refugee camp. My family is still there, um, and like I grew up hearing the stories of like what Israeli militia did to them, like the family members that they killed and how they got away with it. And one of my aunts is she witnessed a bomb, Israeli airstrike drop in front of a bus right in front of her um and it's been hard to reach out to them with the service being cut out so frequently it's hard for them to get access to water food electricity my cousin is a paratrooper in the israeli defense forces he's 20 years old and within the first day of the war 20 of his friends were killed or taken hostage how would you describe the climate right now what you're seeing what you're hearing on campus i've noticed a lot more stares, a lot more unease just around me being around. There was an instance where I noticed someone taking a video of me from his car and like he wasn't even really trying to hide it. I wasn't doing anything. I was just walking out of Friday prayer. It's been immensely challenging to be in this campus when I'm seeing my peers march down the streets where we have to walk to get to class every day, chanting things like from the river to the sea, 
which we've seen as really a call for genocide of, or an ethnic cleansing of Jewish people. Our coalition, our individual organizations all came together and condemned anti-Semitism because we utterly believe anti-Semitism is abhorrent and has a deeply violent history. Some of those classmates tell me that some of the chants and phrases, like from the river to the sea, to mean the extermination of Jews. What do you have to say to them? Okay. Everybody in this vicinity, regardless of religion, of race, of ethnicity, should live free on the one state, on the one secular state with equal citizenship. That's what it meant. And the question I have to ask people then, where is it from the river to the sea, Palestinians shouldn't be safe? I want peace in the Middle East too, just as much as anyone else. My problem is with that slogan in specific, not whatever message anyone thinks they're sharing with it, because Hamas has used it. It's been appropriated by a terrorist organization. So you can't say it anymore and think that it means peace. What would you say to a Palestinian person who said that when they hear the word Zionist or Zionism, that they think it means me and my family need to leave the region, that we have to leave our homes? So the definition of Zionism, right, is the self-determination of the Jewish people to their ancestral homeland. Saying that we have a right to a land and a right to exist as a people is not saying we're, we're agree with the right-wing government um, in Israel right now. Cornell has released several statements in response to student fears, increasing security and promising new programs to fight anti-Semitism and to bring in experts in Jewish history. The university is taking it very seriously, right? We've seen support on a federal and a state level, uh, which, is, which is really comforting, really nice. As people who are Muslim or Arab on campus, we see the administration clearly has a bias. Cornell's initial statement did not mention Islamophobia or Palestinian people. They tell NBC News they condemn all forms of discriminatory bias. What would it take to bring the temperature on campus down to maybe just slightly open the door to either healthier dialogue or, or more dialogue here on campus. I would really encourage students who are interested in dialogue to reach out to me, to each other. I think it's something that's really scary and really hard. For no one on this campus to use the slogan from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free again. I think it's just too painful for Jewish students to hear. Until I can be seen as a human, and until my humanity of being a Muslim, of being a Palestinian is seen first, then it's hard to have a conversation. I already know going in, if that's the first question I'm being asked, that I condemn the killing of innocent civilians, that I'm not a terrorist, that they can't see past my scarf. Mm. You know, Savannah, what really struck me in my time on Cornell's campus is just how much language and the different meanings these words hold to people of different communities Absolutely. impacts this debate and makes it really hard for people to sit down and just have a conversation about their pain. Simple things like what Zionism means, mm. what from the river to the, sea, to the sea represents to people, they truly have such different cultural contexts. And so long as people believe that their own classmates, the people who live in the room down the hall from them, right. don't want them to exist or don't respect their humanity, it's really hard to see a path forward. And I think college campuses, in a way, are, of course, representing what's happening all across our country and the world right now. Absolutely. Such a microcosm. Great conversations. Antonia Hilton, thank you so much. Good to have you here with us. Well, coming up, it's been 60 years since the assassination of JFK, and we're taking a look back at the moment that shook the world through the eyes of a Secret Service member who witnessed the incident. That is up next. Welcome back. Another package of U.S. military aid is heading to Ukraine. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin announced the $100 million presidential drawdown for Ukraine during a surprise visit to Kyiv, saying the U.S. is committed to helping Ukraine defend itself and to deter Russian aggression over the long term. I wanted to reassure uh, the leadership that the United States of America will continue to support Ukraine. And, uh, and so, you know, we... Uh, uh, we talked about uh, the things that we're going to continue to do to make sure that they have what they need to be successful on the battlefield. For more, we are joined by NBC News senior White House correspondent Gabe Gutierrez in Washington. Hi, Gabe. Thanks for joining us on this. So what do we know about what is in this new package? Uh, hi there, Savannah. Good morning. Well, as you said, uh, the U.S. has given tens of billions of dollars in security aid to Ukraine, but this is the smallest security aid 
package announced so far is still $100 million, and it's set to include uh, several things, including additional ammunition, a high mobility artillery rocket system, and also demolition munitions to clear obstacles. But this is all meant to help Ukraine as uh, the country heads into this difficult uh, offensive with uh, against Russia uh, over the winter months. And uh, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin making this surprise visit to Kyiv as he tries to rally support really around the world. And there you see some of that new security assistance for Ukraine, the ammunition uh, that I mentioned, Stinger anti-aircraft missiles, and also Javelin and AT4 anti-armor systems. All um, uh, this is this is all things that the defense secretary says will be critical to Ukraine as it fights in the upcoming months. Savannah. Gabe, we know Secretary Austin also sat down with Ukrainian President Zelensky along with several senior leaders to discuss this continuing need for military support. Do we have any idea of how those conversations went and what else we're going to see from the secretary during this visit? Uh, well, there you see that video, the handshakes and you know all smiles there from uh, Secretary uh, Lloyd Austin, and this all comes as uh, President Zelensky has been you know making the rounds, trying to get the world to or try to battle against war fatigue. Of course, with all the attention on the Israel-Hamas war uh, at the highest levels, really uh, 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 around the world, uh, there has been this sense that less attention has been paid to the Ukraine-Russia war uh, over the last several months. So this has been. Part Part of President Zelensky trying to keep this war as top of mind, and Defense uh, Secretary Lloyd Austin making that surprise visit to Kyiv uh, to signal the U.S.'s staunch support for Ukraine. Savannah. Gabe, this is Secretary Austin's second trip actually to Kyiv, but of course it comes under far different circumstances, a different backdrop than his first, now that we're more than a year and a half into this war. And some European countries like Poland have started scaling back support, saying that they need to main resources to defend themselves. What is the White House saying about any type of cracks in support for Ukraine? Well, yeah, and as I mentioned, there has been some war fatigue uh, really around the world. You mentioned Poland, but also here domestically, especially among some uh, Republicans in Congress who have been very skeptical of the White House's supplemental funding request, asking for more uh, funding, not just for uh, Ukraine, but also for the Israel-Hamas war, tying it to some other domestic priorities that the White House argues is essential to national security, including uh, border funding and also uh, funding for uh, the uh, the Indo-Pacific and uh, you know more funding for. Taiwan as it faced a growing threat uh, from China. So this all comes as the White House tries to signal its uh, strong support for Ukraine and trying to convince the skeptical Republicans to back that supplemental funding request and to battle against that war fatigue, Savannah. All right. Gabe Gutierrez, thank you very much. Well, tomorrow will mark 60 years since the assassination of President John F. Kennedy in Dallas. There are now only two Secret Service members still living who witnessed this historic event. One of those men, Clint Hill, sat down with NBC News correspondent Jacob Sobroff to reflect on that day. Hey there. The Secret Service agent assigned to First Lady Jacqueline Kennedy was Clint Hill, a then 31-year-old man. He was just feet away from the president when he was assassinated on that fateful day in Dallas. As the years pass by and new theories emerge about the events of that day, he is more determined than ever to set the record straight. Sixty years later, the images of the assassination of President John F. Kennedy are just as haunting. But 91-year-old Clint Hill can recall every detail without opening his eyes. How often do you think about that day? Uh, at least once every day, maybe more. Still there embedded in my brain, and it never leaves. Hill was trailing the presidential limousine in the motorcade as the Secret Service agent assigned to First Lady Jacqueline Kennedy. When three shots were fired on that November day in Dallas, Texas, the young agent jumped onto the back of the limo in a desperate attempt to protect the president and Mrs. Kennedy cementing his place in that dark day in history. There was no thinking there, you just did it. Yeah, you know, just reaction. Do you recall having any thoughts in that moment? Just get there, get on top of the car, get your body above theirs, between them and any possible person that's trying to do them harm. The 91-year-old has written a new afterword for his book, Five Days in November, ahead of the 60th anniversary of the assassination. What is there? that you're saying in here that you haven't already said? Well, I was con very concerned that uh, the po general population still has not accepted the truth about the assassination. It's hard for me to believe that 
the numbers of people who still believe in conspiracies. They don't really accept the actual fact of what did happen. Hill's recollection has never wavered. One man, one gun, three shots, all from the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository. But he worries about those who give credence to conspiracy theories that suggest otherwise. He said, I fear that once all of us who were witnesses to history are gone, the truth will be buried along with us. I'm sure it's not lost on you that there's only two surviving Secret Service members from that day. You worry about that time when neither of you will be here? I just hope that people will read this and believe it because it's truth and not listen to the other garbage that comes out. Of late, those conspiracy theories have been fueled by new claims made in a recent book by Hill's former partner, Secret Service agent Paul Landis. Landis writing about new recollections of that day, leading to new questions about the Warren Commission report. Hill dismisses Landis's account as fiction. What Mr. Landis had written in his book cannot be true. You think he's being dishonest or just has a different recollection of what happened? I don't know. What does it say to the American public that the two of you don't have your stories aligned? Well, it just gives them further reason to believe in the conspiracy theories. And that's unfortunate. That's a deep, deep concern to you. Very deep concern to me. Conspiracy theories are now conspiracy facts. Hill also takes issue with how director Oliver Stone's feature film and documentary about the assassination have further fueled those theories. It was not fact. It was fiction. I mean, if you're going to make it fiction, announce it that way. This is a made-up story. Don't tell people that this is fact when it's not. And that's what he has done. Did he ever call you? No. And don't bother now. It's too late for that junk. Hill says he's accepted that his actions on that day will likely be how he's remembered. What does that acceptance look like or mean to you? Well, people keep thanking me for what I did, but uh, I appreciate that very much. But I didn't complete my task, which was to save the president's life. And that's what's bothered me all these years, 60 years now. Job was to keep the president alive and safe. And I was not able to do that. Your legacy, what do you want it to be? Well, I just, you know, I tried. I tried to do the best job I could. Uh, unfortunately, it wasn't enough. Do you ever think about how, had this not happened, what your life might be like? Oh, yeah. It was much calmer, much simpler. I wouldn't have had the experience that I've had, though. I was a lucky man to be given the responsibilities I was given. I'm very grateful. To this day, Clint Hill believes if he had moved faster, he could have taken those bullets and saved President Kennedy's life. While he can't turn back time, he does feel that it's his duty to set the record straight about the facts of the assassination while he's still alive to do it. But ultimately, while he's made such a huge contribution to American history and society, he says his happiness with his wife, Lisa, is what he is most proud of. Mm. Back to you. Oh, all right, Jacob, thank you so much. Well, coming up, it may have been a disappointing loss yesterday for Travis Kelsey's Kansas City Chiefs, but the football star is revealing new details about his romance with Taylor Swift. More up next. Welcome back. Well, we have, of course, been following the budding romance between Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey. And now the Chiefs tight end is revealing new details about their relationship. He opened up in a new interview with The Wall Street Journal before taking the field last night in a Monday night football Super Bowl rematch against big brother Jason and his Philadelphia Eagles. NBC News correspondent Emily Aketa joins us now with more on this. Hey, Emily, good morning. Hey, good morning to you. So we've gotten familiar with, we've gotten used to seeing Taylor Swift in the stands cheering on Travis Kelsey at his games. But last night, the superstar was more than 5,000 miles miles away performing her rescheduled show in Brazil as we're learning more about how their budding romance became a reality in a revealing new interview with the star tight end. Chiefs tight end Travis Kelsey scored a pivotal touchdown in last night's game but Kansas City fell short after the Philadelphia Eagles rallied for a Monday night victory. The loss giving big brother Jason his first ever NFL win over Travis in a rematch of last year's Super Bowl showdown. 
While the Kelsey brothers' beloved Mama Kelsey was in attendance. There's Donna Kelsey, who uh, well, she may have an empty seat somewhere in that suite. <laughs> Notably absent in the stands, Travis's main squeeze, Taylor Swift. <laughs> who was performing a rescheduled show in Rio de Janeiro. Swift still devastated after a fan collapsed in sweltering heat at her concert Friday and died. The Brazilian event organizer distributing free water at last night's show. Hey, Travis. Hey, Taylor. And this morning, fans getting new insight into Swift's love story with Kelsey, who spoke to the Wall Street Journal, calling her hilarious and a genius. I've never been a man of words. Being around her, seeing how smart Taylor is, has been mind-blowing. I'm learning every day. He says they share compatible worldviews and family values. His mom, Donna, also chiming in, addressing her comments about Taylor last month with Savannah and Hoda. What was she like? What was yeah. it? I mean, you, so you got to know her a little bit. You got to see the couple games. How was it? It was okay. Yeah. <laughs> Donna apparently was trying not to sound too enthusiastic, but came off underwhelmed. Mama Kelsey now clarifying, he's happier than I've seen him in a long time. God bless him. He shot for the stars. Okay, so back to the game overnight. The Eagles having some fun, and they posted a friendship bracelet on Instagram after their win with the caption, in our winning era. Oh, that is just a low blow. Come on, Their guys. marketing team was ready for yeah. that. <laughs> All right, Emily, thank you so much. Thanks. Let's get to financial headlines now. Citigroup has begun a new round of job cuts. CNBC Silvana Hanau joins us with that. Another financial headlines. Hey, Silvana, good morning. Hey, Savannah, good morning. Yes, yeah, so Citigroup starting a major round of layoffs and management overhaul. The bank isn't saying how many employees are due to be cut and hasn't set a target for total layoffs. Bloomberg reporting Citi has cut roughly 10% of senior manager roles. It's been a tough year for Wall Street banks, which have struggled with a slump in deal making, the uncertain economy, and higher interest rates. Bonuses in the financial industry are expected to be flat or down this year. Hotel workers in Las Vegas have voted overwhelmingly to approve a new five-year contract with casino giant Caesars. This signals an end to a long labor dispute that brought the threat of a historic strike to the Strip. The Culinary Workers Union is also expected to approve contracts with Wynn Resorts and MGM later this week. The deals were reached earlier this month, just hours before the union would have walked out at 18 hotels and casinos, including the Bellagio, MGM, Grand and Caesars Palace. The contracts cover more than 35,000 workers. And Hertz is teaming with charging network EasyGo to offer renters of electric vehicles one year of discount charging with no monthly subscriptions or charge fees. It's like a discount gas card except for EVs. Now renters can sign up online or scan a QR code at Hertz locations and set up an EVGO account from now through next November. Then you can use any of EVGO's more than 950 charging stations across the country, Savannah. All right, awesome. Savannah Hanau, thank you so much. You got it. Coming up, what are the chances? Meet the real girl who has a string of things in common with next year's American Girl Doll of the Year. That's up next. Welcome back. Well, if you're one of those people who saw this and was skeptical when Snoop Dogg posted that he was, quote, giving up smoke last week, you were right. On Monday, Snoop posted a follow-up message sharing an ad with the caption, I'm done with smoke. I'm going smokeless with Solo Stove. Solo Stove is a company that makes smokeless fire pits, and it's now released a limited edition fire pit called the Snoop Stove, describing it as hot enough to make the dog father go smokeless. Snoop's personal brand, of course, is forever linked with smoking, and he is known for smoking weed with celebrities on his YouTube show. One fan posted on X that he had the world's stoners questioning their life choices for this ad. Well, there you go. Finally this hour, a happy accident. The 2024 American Girl Doll of the Year has a surprise connection to a Minnesota toddler, and it all happened by coincidence. NBC News reporter Eva Anderson from our affiliate station CARE 11 in Minneapolis has the story. Do you want to make an ice cream cone with mom? Lila Minetti. Is that good? You want a bite? Has many talents. The tiny tot runs an ice cream shop. He likes out. And gives expert embraces. 
I can do push-up. She even provides medical care to her top customers. She likes to play doctor a lot. We think she's going to be Dr. Lila. So you'd think it'd be no surprise that Lila Minetti is American Girl Dolls 2024 Girl of the Year. Wow, Lila, you did such a great job working with Hollyhock. Well, I got a text from my mom that was just like, check this out. It was a link to a doll that was named Lila Minetti. I thought she just customized a doll on the website. Um, and then I Googled it. She's like, you should check this out. You should Google it. They had named this girl of the year, Lila Minetti. This is the look. Here's a catch. The 2024 girl of the year namesake doll of this tender toddler <laughs> has zero connection to this Minnesota family. And that's where the story gets weirder. <laughs> Do I mom to get it? Guess where this doll is from? The point when we saw that the doll was from St. Paul, Minnesota, it started to get a little bit more strange. She likes that. She likes that picture. Good job. I'm like, there's no way they could have found a name like that without finding my family. American Girl confirmed with Care 11 there was no spying on the real Lila Minetti to create the toy Lila Minetti. The doll's backstory and name were written by an author. And to celebrate the apparent coincidence... Lila! What's that? Oh my goodness! Ah! Lila, look. It's Lila. The company sent over her tiny twin. Your name's Lila, too. Mm -hmm. The shock still hasn't worn off. It's just crazy to see a name in print like this. Really this wild. is absolutely nuts. And the doll's journal is a map of their own surroundings. Picture of Minneapolis and St. Paul. A, a little of... map here. The real Lila may eventually take up the hobbies of the doll's character. A horseback rider, a gymnast, endless learning opportunities. What's that? That's a puppy. So whether she stays an ice cream scooper or a physician or a skilled stylist, your girl of the year, the future's bright 2024. <laughs> All right, thanks to Eva Anderson for that reporting. The doll is available for purchase now, and it's accompanying novel, Lila Goes for Gold, hits shelves January 2nd. Isn't that sweet? Well, thank you very much for being with me today. That does it for this hour of morning news now. There's a live look at our Christmas tree right here in our backyard. Stay with us. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.